Uh, by way of an introduction, the Commission um, felt it would be really helpful to get a bit of a, a feel for what the public think about some of the issues that we've been deliberating here today. And we took a film crew out to three areas in Wales. We took it to Pontypridd, we took it to Swansea, and we took it to uh, Wrexham. We wanted to try and understand what do they feel and what, what, what was they thought. We've got a little short video that we want to show you before we go into the main question time panel. But let's just find out before we do what the public think and what their early thoughts on this are. Thank you. I think there are different parts of our government that just fundamentally don't see the need to invest at the scale that you need to to make it a success. Then I think there is a sort of controversial view that because the NHS has been such a success since its inception, you know, inception of Niren Bevan you know, after the Second World War, then I think we're almost, there's lots of people that hold that, it's almost sacrosanct that you could sort of perhaps uncouple a bit of that. I think in all of the countries where it is more successful there is there is a sort of more of an insurance based element. How it's funded is fundamentally different. So I think the question is how can you how can you fund the NHS in a different way? Maybe maybe looking at as you know sort of types of insurance premiums or learn from what the other countries, but how do you do that in a way that protects everything that's great about the NHS? Yeah, and that whole principle that it's accessible for everybody. So I think yeah, you, have to make, you have to make that sort of accessibility to everybody, um, yeah, that has to be a red line. But then why not you know, throw the rule book out and look at other ways of um, bringing in additional revenue? I know they're talking about um, like sort of collaboration with different boards and I think that's important like I said before where the notes weren't passed and also getting everyone online like I don't understand why that's still all written and I just think that adds to time and the amount of paperwork I noticed that they had to f I know I know they have to protect themselves and there's lots of reasons why there's lots of paperwork I mean I'm a teacher and it's the same but sometimes it just takes away from the actual job and it takes away from them actually helping and that me and and the time it takes and therefore like patient care is limited then so I think things like that can be massively improved and I know that takes a long time to get everyone online and all the training but they just need to make the jump. I think the environment in which we breathe in which just walking up the street as you've just stopped for a bus you know that what the, the films that are being chucked out there are certainly not helping us I think that Covid the one thing that Covid was massively positive on was the fact that within two weeks of us closing down the environment cleared the air was far clearer the sky was clearer it proved how much rubbish that we're allowing to be pumped out into our lungs by the government by not taking proactive action on things like probably having better transport systems in which we don't use so much cars better systems in which perhaps the buses Buses are next and negligible what we pay to go on the buses, but they run on a regular basis. We know we can catch them, we've got no problems, etc. I think it's got to be a, a, a they've got to work together on it. The healthcare and the, the social side of it have got to work together on it. You can't have the situation where we've had people who can't get out of hospital because there's nowhere for them to go. So it, it has to be combined efforts. I think the bed blocking situation is massive. I've, obviously, the age that I am now, I've got friends who've got parents who perhaps are more elderly, um, some suffering with dementia and things like that. And I think, uh, obviously, the care sort of gone are the days where you had lots of residential care homes in sort of communities and things like that. And I think people aren't being released back into sort of individual homes because of care plans or whatever. They, like a one friend, for example, who had her mum lives independently, is quite able, however, had had a fall in hospital and um, wasn't allowed back into her home, although her mobility was exactly the same. Uh, she got better, but she was in hospital for three weeks. But she was, she was fine, she was okay to go, but for some reason there were boxes to tick and things like that, so that's quite frustrating. 
across Wales about the, the view of people across Wales for the underlying theme of this conference, which is what next for the future of health and social care. Some fascinating insights there, and I've never seen Swansea looking so nice as I did there. And I can say that because, like Rowan, I come from Swansea too. Um, so this is very exciting for me. I haven't taken part in a panel quite like this in a conference before. The last time I did it for work, it was before the last Sinev election. And because of the COVID situation then, I was sat in an empty lecture theater with lots of politicians on Zoom in front of me. So it's really nice to be able to, say, to, to, to look at you and interact with you properly uh, for this session. It's a, it's a brilliant panel, uh, as you can read in your guide, but I'll briefly introduce everybody. We have um, the former Archbishop of Wales and Canterbury, uh, the Right Reverend and Right Honourable Rowan Williams. We have uh, Lord Crisp which we heard from this morning. We've got Nairi Bevan, of course, a Bevan commissioner, works for Ken Spectre at Wills, I think, and uh, great niece of the founder of the NHS, Camilla Hawthorne, um, who's chair of the Royal College of GPs, I think, at the minute, uh, UK-wide, and I think I last interviewed you in your back garden, if, if I remember correctly. And still, yeah, let's not forget that, of, of course. Um, then we have Kendra Jean Nuamdi, who's a Bevan future thinker, to explain what that means is that you won an award, I think, outlining what you thought the NHS would look like in 2050. Is that correct? And then we have Bami Aden Adeni Pekun. I think I got it right. Uh, and you work for Thais, which is the new body representing patients' voice in Wales. Obviously, we had the Community Health Council before, but now there's an overarching body. Um, now, I think the deal was, is that we'd start this off with each of you just giving some brief comments and thoughts right at the very beginning of this session. So let's go in reverse order, starting with you, Bami. Oh, you need to grab the mics. So if you keep one that side, one in the middle, and a couple this side, then we'll be okay. Okay, I'm, I'm here not just as a board member of CLIS, but also as a patient, so someone who's used health services. And if I were to talk about my concerns, even with the advancements in health, even with the advance, advancements in treatments, there's the issue of health inequalities. And we keep, it's almost as if we go round and round in circles and nothing changes. But my vision for the NHS, my vision for health, is one in which patient voices are heard. Because, so let me tell you something, regardless of your, your circumstances, regardless of how learned you are or how wealthy you are, the second you walk into hospital as a patient, you are vulnerable. And the power dynamics changes. And the way the health system is set up at the moment, things are done to you, you are being spoken to. Most of the time, what matters to you is never heard. And that is one of the biggest things I'm hoping will change. Because we talk about co-production, because if I had a pound for every time in research or in policy that I, that I hear about co-production, I'll be a multimillionaire. And yet, it doesn't translate into practice. So my vision for the NHS is one in which patients and service users are seen as partners, not as less than, not as people to be spoken down to, but people who have views that are valid and can influence improvement. Thank you very much indeed. And we heard about that a little bit earlier, of course. Moving on. Hello, my name is Kendra Jean Ramadi, and I'm a fourth year medical student at Cardiff University. I'd first of all like to thank the Bevan Commission for giving me this opportunity. Um, I think there are lots of young people across Wales who have opinions about what our future should, should look like, but no platform to do so, so thank you. Um, my vision of health and social care um, in Wales is one of similar to what Bami was saying, um, about dismantling barriers for certain communities across Wales. And I'm still very early on in my career, and I know there's still so much for me to understand about healthcare, 
But what I have encountered so far is that there are so many issues facing our health system and very few solutions. And so logically for me, again, sitting from a, a position of maybe naivety, is logically, why aren't we going to these communities and having conversations with them, building relationships with them to start to understand what's going on. I think a lot of the time we seem to be acting from positions of uncertainty or assumption or hoping what we do is best. But I think, or something that I'm very passionate about and the team of students that I'm working with that um, won this award is going into these communities and just asking them and just making sure they feel that, that their voices are heard because our health system is not just in our hospitals, it's in our communities. It's amongst the individuals that are affected by all, all of these issues within our health system. So yes, definitely giving a voice to people and working with them to, build, to find solutions. Thank you. Thank you. So it's so nice to hear what, you, what you're saying as a, an incoming doctor to the profession. I've been a GP now for 35 years, um, and uh, I'm going to start with my, what my vision for primary care would be, should be. I'd like to see an organized um, setup. I'd like to see us having enough time for our patients so that we can do what we've been trained to do, to be able to assess people with enough time for them to talk to us, um, to be able to look at their physical, their psychological, and their social um, contexts, and to see them in a holistic way. Over the years that I've been a GP, I've done uh, what you were saying. I've been out to communities. I've worked very closely with communities, particularly in Cardiff, and before that in Manchester, and before that in Nottingham. So wherever I've been, it is possible to do it. But you need the time to do it. You need to have the headspace. You need to be able to um, want to do it um, as well. Now, looking ahead then, it's not just that holistic view of patients. It's not just what was being said so um, poetically by Bami as well about what matters to me instead of what is the matter with me. It's also about communities, exactly as you're saying. Uh, and in order to really serve our communities, we need integrated, multiple, dis multiple disciplinary uh, teams who can uh, deal with all the things that I can't do as a GP, um, but who work with me. Uh, we need to be able to be integrated with social care so that on those occasions when I've gone to do a house call for somebody, say, who's elderly and who's fallen um, and is in a situation where she really, he or she can't, usually it's a she, I'm afraid, can't really cope at home any longer, uh, and there is just no care available, one is then forced to send them into hospital because that's the only place where you know they're going to be safe. And that's not at all what I want as a GP, and that's not at all what the patient wants either as the patient. Um, and we need to be able to find much better ways of dealing with that, particularly as we have an aging population, and we need to be organizing our service in such a way that we can provide care closer to home, the sort of care that people would want, the sort of care that you'd want for your mum or perhaps for yourself in time. I also see a future where artificial intelligence, IT, um, diagnostics, near patient testing are all close to the patient. You know, where as a GP, I can be part of a big health hub where we can really deal with most things um, in the community and not have to send people off to a hospital where they can feel completely um, discombobulated, really, uh, by the whole business of going into a hospital. So that's what I see in the future. What's happening now? Um, this whole conference is being called the tipping point. And I think in primary care, we're very close to tipping. And actually, in some places, we've already tipped. Um, you know, we have GPs leaving the profession faster than they are entering it at all stages of their careers. GPs who have recently trained, GPs in mid-career, and GPs towards the end of their careers. And why are they doing that? The big issue is workload. Um, capacity is far less than the demand, far, far less than the demand. And when you're seeing 50 to 70 patients in a day, you just don't have the time to be able to give people the patience, the time uh, that your training has enabled you to give them. So there's an awful lot to be done, um, and we really need to work together, um, all of us, in order to bring my vision to fruition. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here today. Um, as you would expect, I am very passionate and committed about the NHS. 
as is everybody in this room, else you would not be here contributing and um, just being part of this conversation. Um, my background is 40 years plus in, in social care primarily, but, but health as well. Um, so I've been around the block a bit, so I know some of the challenges. Um, my vision is very much about integration, as Camilla said, about social care and health at the primary care level, working together, really, truly integrated. And today I've been very just embraced by people from around the world and in the UK telling us that in Wales we can do it. We can, everybody is telling us we can do it if we were just a bit more courageous and, and really, really got on with it. So my vision is that our politicians and our civil servants will, from today, decide to do something that's really, really special and will make a big difference. Now there's a challenge for you. <laughs> Nigel. Uh, I'm going to make three, uh, three quick points. The first one is health is made at home, hospitals are for repairs, repeating that wonderful Ugandan expression. Um, and we need to be careful as health people, we don't just talk to ourselves. We've got to go out and talk to the businesses, to the farmers, to the food industry, um, to the whole range of society, as well, of course, of patients and, uh, and community groups, uh, and work with them about influencing. We're not going to tackle the social determinants unless we do that. Um, I know it's difficult, but I think that's part of our wider role. Second point picks up very much on some of what's been said. I think we need to have uh, a, a vision for the NHS re-articulated for today, some of which I think we've heard down here, about what it really means in practice, and that that's about people like the people in this room planning that, bringing it together. I remember we did this in 2000 in England, and because it engaged the clinicians and a lot of people, it gave us goodwill for three years to move forward. And I think we need that goodwill and energy. And my final point is back your people. If I were with the government, I'd say back your people. Don't attack the GPs because primary care is in a difficult spot. Um, and remember, a lot of the things that, that the most sustainable major changes came from the clinicians. Think about social prescribing. That wasn't provided by some management consultants. Think about nurse prescribing uh, and what happened about that. These were clinician-led and professional-led. Thank you. The trouble with speaking last is that all the good points have already been made, <laughs> and they have. But I'll just give you four quick thoughts about our subject. First is really underlining something that's been said very effectively by several on the panel. And that is, a good health service for the future is one which takes agency seriously. It assumes that people are not just passive in their engagement with health. It's a service that encourages people to take responsibility, but also gives them some of the skills and some of the insights and resources they need to take responsibility. So agency, first thing. Second thing is that a good health service needs to be itself proactive. Not just a damage limitation service, not just a safety net, but something engaging with a range of social processes and social institutions to create the equivalent in the health area of active citizenship, or indeed to think of health itself as, as intrinsic to active citizenship. Responsibility for your own health and for that of others and all that goes with that. Third thing, and I'm very glad I've heard this so um, strongly underlined so far, is we do need joining up across the, the field. I'm currently involved with the um, Independent Commission on the Constitutional Future of Wales, um, which is looking at the future of devolved powers and so forth. And one thing we've heard from a number of communities across Wales is, especially the more deprived and marginal communities, is we are baffled by the fact that the services offered to us, the public services offered to us, don't join up. Health and care at home or in other settings, education, welfare and benefits, employment patterns, all these are actually deeply interconnected. 
and a robust health service will be one that is working in coordinated ways in communities to deliver that, I would say. And the last thing is, once again, just um, echoing what's been said, I'm afraid. We do need to think very seriously about how to... I was tempted to say reinvent, but it's not as if it's gone out of the window, it's just it's struggling, as we've heard. How to reanimate a humanistic approach to diagnosis and care. Something which is capable of looking at patients in three dimensions. To factor in those elements in our poor health, which are not just clinical. And that makes me think just a little bit about the, the threat and the promise of AI. Um, I think here of that um, classic article by Phil Whitaker a couple of years ago on AI as a di diagnostic tool and its strengths and weaknesses, where he sets out beautifully clearly exactly what the pluses and minuses are. How do we learn to make AI a good servant when it's such a bad master? And that requires a really strong sense of what the humanistic and holistic dimensions of healthcare involve. Thank you ever so much, all of you. Right then, I, I think we do have some roving microphones. Um, so if you can indicate if you'd like to um, ask a question, then somebody will get to you. Before, but, but, and I will also be scanning Silo, which I have on my phone now, which you can submit questions in real time live, presumably, if my phone doesn't conk out in the middle of this. So, but can I ask a question of my own? Um, fascinating all uh, as those insights were, some of the key elements we have been hearing for a very long time. We've been talking about integration, for example. Why can health and social care not work better? I mean, the health service have been talking about empowering patients for a very long time. Um, uh, the acknowledgement that so much of what keeps us healthy is nothing to do with the NHS and healthcare. Given that we're still in a position that we face ourselves now, what are the barriers of making that happen? And does it call into, the que into question maybe something more fundamental about how we deliver healthcare in this country? Um, and feel free to chip in uh, whoever wants to go first on that one. Okay, I'll go first on that. Because again, like I was saying, we talk about co-production and it doesn't happen. But I believe part of the problem is what is deeply entrenched in me the medical model, whether it's in study. So for example, you go into hospital and everything like that. A consultant is giving you diagnosis. In, in their training and in their expertise, they already feel they know what's best for you. So I'll give you a classic example. I have a family history of breast cancer. My mom and my sister died of breast cancer at the age of 46. When I was diagnosed at 37, now my breast surgeon, she saw me and she was like, okay, you know what, you're young. So this is what's gonna happen, that's what's gonna happen, that's what's gonna happen. And I'm like, hold on, no. I, I said, before you start telling me the things that would happen, how about we look at all of the results of the tests, including checking to see whether the cancer has spread or not, and then going back to your multidisciplinary team meeting and, ask, and asking them, what are the pros and cons of you putting me on chemotherapy? Now, she was a bit put out, and I, I, I get a point, but at the same time, I wasn't your, your run-of-the-mill patient, but at the end of the day, because of the way that clinical systems are, are done, because of the way medicine is taught, things are still like from the, the consultant is God and the patients are minions. Now, we have to get away from that because if there's no, there's no way of sugarcoating it. We need to get away from that. We need to start understanding that, yes, and this is what I tell clini clinicians. I said, you are the experts in your profession, but you are not the expert in my lived experience. Okay, that very interesting point, and maybe that is more about culture than structures. Anybody else really feel strongly on this one? So I'm also an academic medical educator, 
And this training of medical students is coming through now. I'm sure you'd um, back me up on this. Um, and certainly in GP training, um, they cannot pass their clinical exams unless they can demonstrate how they involve the patient in sharing options with the patient and helping the patient make the decision with them. Now, it isn't just a question of laying out the options and saying which one would you like. It is more a question of guiding, because of course otherwise, what's the point of having your medical training if you can't guide somebody and say, well actually, in this particular case, I really don't think an antibiotic is what you need for this particular type of sore throat. But it, you know, it's, it's, it's about guiding, and that's really what I think you mean as well about co-production. So it is coming through the training. Now the problem, of course, is that the, that the people in senior positions have been trained in the old way. And so I think, and again, you may want to say a bit more, um, that a lot of medical students and young doctors then end up being very conflicted, because on the one hand, they've been trained one way, and yet their seniors are behaving in another. And, you know, when you're in that situation, what do you do? So I'm gonna... <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'd say, yes, that's exactly what happens. So we have been taught about the biosocial psycho psychological model, and we learn so much about patient involvement, and asking patients about their ideas and concerns. But when you're on the wards, the doctors have no time for any of this. It's the first barrier we see as students. Um, so you never see those questions being asked. And sometimes I am inquisitive and I do ask, why didn't you ask the patient why they're feeling anxious or maybe other situations that could be happening in their lives? And one doctor actually said, that's for the GP to deal with. Um, so it's just, yeah, very conflicting. So it's just, I think, just needs to be emphasized again and again the importance of why we're being taught what we're being taught so it does stick with us and we're not um, influenced by our elders. I really echo everything that's been said about um, the, the culture and the need for change and the way it's changing. We can't, of course, entirely avoid the elephant in the room, which is a political elephant and the political will to implement because that means more public expenditure. Mm. And because we are very much enthralled to a myth about irresponsible public expenditure, politicians back away from grasping that particular nettle again and again, I think. And the bizarre thing of the last couple of decades is that most reforms, especially big structural reforms in the, the NHS, have often looked like a more opaque kind of funding regime to the average person in the street. That's something that, uh, that can be politically exploited as well. Mm. But the basic fact, what is, the basic question, what is the kind of health service we desire and will pay for and will trust? And that's not a question I hear very clearly expressed in lots of political discourse around this, I'm afraid. There are those that feel that politics should be taken out of the NHS in some form or another. Who knows how that can be done? Because there's huge political decisions about all of this, of course. Um, but is there a space, perhaps, beyond the knockabout politics for a sensible discussion? Or will that ever occur? Shall I pick up on, on the politics? Can I first of all say that when I was talking earlier, I was the one person who had had a privilege of addressing the audience already. Um, I made this, this point that it is what happens in the heads of the clinician, so I'm absolutely agreeing with you, you Bami, is what happens in health. And so the changes that you're talking about, because talking about, we listen to you. If you think healthcare is all about doctors and hospitals, we'll think it's all about doctors and hospitals. So I think that is fantastically important. On the politics thing, I mean, what we need politics for is to shape the overall picture, to give us, to provide the resources, to be clear about how the health system fits within the greater good of society because health isn't an end in itself it's about human flourishing is what we're looking at Bef so there's all of that joining up again and joining up but not getting d stuck into the detail not second guessing camilla about what gps should do yeah. i'll come, come to the floor very, floor very quickly but Nigeria, I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts because your great uncle used considerable political skill in order to set up the health service um yet often it gets bogged down these days. What do you think he would have made of the situation now and <coughs> any solutions? Obviously, he would never imagine the health being, service being able to do all it does now. No, no, and when you think of what we've been talking about in some of the, the breakout rooms around AI and you know, the tech, how technology is 
that's developed and grown. Um, it, it, it would just be just an amazingly different place for him. Um, but I think the fundamentals of the NHS in terms of free at the point of delivery, equity for all, um, dealing with those people who are in need and might not have the resources, even personal as well as financial, to seek out the help are still very fundamental to the NHS and I hope would remain. I think for me there's a, there's a massive piece of work to do about having a debate with the, how with citizens mm. throughout Wales because we are ex the, the NHS can't do everything for everybody and I think there's, there's a debate and I think the Bevan Commission are going to be involved in how we do that with our citizens throughout Wales which is going to be very important. The priorities I'll come to in a bit and how you prioritise but first of all could, are there a couple of questions from the floor I could get at this stage anybody keen? Uh, uh, that, there we are. If we can get a mic, yep, yeah, on its way. We hear time and time again that we need to start having conversations with communities, but if we're not open to listen to those communities and we still go back to our ivory towers, and come out with the same evidence, we are not going to improve. So my argument is, how do we use the media in a positive way rather than a, a negative way to start that conversation and actually build on what is good about the NHS and good about social care to actually say, if you don't start integrating and having these conversations, we will lose it. So how do we do that? Um, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned the media there, because, you know, I've got a little bit of a part to play in this. And uh, what I do find when you talk about integration of health and social care is that um, when I do a report and when producers ask me to look at an issue, it's often to do with the blue lights, the ambulances, the hospital care sector. And you then go, well, please, can we explain how the two systems are intertwined? And if you don't solve social care, it has an impact on the NHS. But it's much less visible. You can't display that in such a dramatic way as you can an overflowing A&E department. So how do you get that message across about that two systems, if you like? Anybody? Well, well for me, there, I think we focus always on the negatives, you know, that... that that there's weights, there's people in ambulances, there's, and, it, and it is quite dire at the minute, and we have to deal with some of those critical issues. But I've been through a system, I've been very unwell in, in my lifetime, and I've been through the health system, and I must say, I was treated with the most utmost respect. I went through Valindra Cancer Centre, and it was a centre of excellence. But you don't hear those things in the press, and I think if we did, I think... You know, the, the minister said this morning, there's so many people out there that are having good health care that we never, ever hear. It's mm. always the ones that, are, you know, are not having any type of response or good health care. And there is things to do, I agree. Mm. And we need to do it at pace, I think, now, and sort some issues out. I, uh, and just, just on that issue, yeah, point out the good, where it works, because it does fabulous work uh, all the time, of course, but the 99% of good work isn't the stuff that gets to the headlines. But on this issue in, in, of integration, we've had a comment here. Um, we've been talking about integrated health and social care for a long time, but good examples are the exception rather than the rule. What will it take to make that happen? First of all, is the premise of that comment correct? Ah, good examples of that, the exception, and why should it be the exception? Because we have structures where integrated health and social care exist, sometimes they still don't work well together. So any thoughts on that in particular? When I, when I first came to Cardiff in 97 as a GP, I was working in the centre of Cardiff, and in those days every GP practice had a social worker attached to the practice, and it was wonderful. Essentially what it meant was that if you saw a patient who told you something that was not a medical issue but needed help, um, social care help, there was a named person whose face I knew who worked in an office just down the corridor from me and I could go and say, hey, could you 
could you spend a few minutes with this patient before she goes home or before she leaves the surgery? Whereas um, a few years later, that was taken away. Um, social services was then in a different place altogether. And we've completely lost that. So now in order to make a referral, I have to write a letter, which I don't mind doing, but it doesn't work as well. And it's not as immediate and it's not what the patient needs uh, in the way that the patient needs it. So, um, you know, I would say that the way forward is that we do need um, ways of being able to meet up more often, talk about um, patient cases that are causing um, difficulties for the patient, and also preferably work under the same roof, um, and, and probably also train, uh, train our students together as well, so that we all get used to doing this, you know, from the get-go. And Rowan, given the nature of society in terms of just the need for us to think those thoughts and expand that thinking that just the way we're doing things may be not right for now. Um, what would you say for that? You put your finger on a real issue which I think affects a whole range of our social life. Where exactly do you have the, conf the conversations that have the leverage to move things on? Because we have plenty of means of communication, it seems, and the more means of communication we have, the less actual conversation goes on. I'm a great believer in models like the citizen's jury and the citizen's assembly. And in some of the work we've done in the um, Constitutional Commission so far, we've tried to create local forums in which these issues can be raised. And I think it's time we had something like a citizen's assembly Wales wide looking at health provision with some of these questions on, on the agenda because we do need to have candid conversation. We do need to, to let voices be heard, going back to Bami's opening point. And we need that to happen in, in something more than just the conversation at the, the shop door mm. way where there's some capacity to identify ongoing issues to distill things and ideally to come out finally with a little bit of policy priority from it. So let's treat this as one of the manifestations of a democratic deficit that needs to be addressed in our country and come at it from that direction. Fantastic, just an observation from um, the app. Um, we've seen the health community get behind the Hello My Name Is campaign, let's have a What Matters To You campaign. That's interesting because it, it touches on a lot of things that we've discussed earlier on. Any more from the floor at this point? There's one right to the back. Thank you. Um, I'm Abuba Obi, consultant of Bamic Surgeon. And having listened to all the conversations, I think very valid points have been made from the time that you see the patient in clinic. For example, you don't have time to talk to them. And that time is absolutely essential. Some of us have been so well, we haven't gone through the health <coughs> system, but if you have, you realize how deficient it can be for clinicians, for GP, for nurses. Hearing about the social worker in every GP practice, I think that's absolutely excellent. I think it should, we should have a point of contact for every patient, because if you don't engage with patients, you really don't get an optimal care for them that actually meets their needs. So my, my question is, where do we get either the time for clinicians, whether they're front-facing or admin staff, because that needs to be addressed. There was a question earlier on today that says, where do we get the time to do this? And one of the answers was, I hope we will, and one was, it probably wouldn't happen in England. And I just thought, I really pray we have that attitude change, because Time is of the essence, and if we can't provide it, then we need to have allied professionals who provide it right there at the point of need. Otherwise, we're missing out so much on the care that can be provided for patients and also meeting their needs, whether it's be in tertiary care or uh, primary care settings. Again, integrated care. So can the money not be in pots so that we're not so defensive about where the money is coming from? And listening to patients again, I think it's so vital. I cannot work 
if my patient doesn't agree with the management plan. And we do need to guide them. But again, the time to explain that is needed. T talking about burnout, I'm sure this is front-facing and non-front-facing. There's so much piled on, and we're expected to work harder. And the more you do that, the more you cut out on a number of things. So again, time is of the essence. And if we can't provide that time, can we have allied professionals who give out quality information, listen to the patients, and we all act as a team? So there's no hierarchy. We're all as a team to achieve one goal. So where do, where do we get that? How can we achieve that? Thank you very much for that. Where do you get the time and headspace when the priority is to deal with the COVID backlog? So that's always been a problem <clears throat> for the whole of my professional career, it's been time. Um, and what used to happen before um, the most recent massive increase in demand was that um, when you were with a patient and you realized they needed more time than their appointment time, you just gave it, you know. Either you gave it then or you arranged for them to come back at the end or the beginning of the next session or something like that, or you saw them over lunch and you gave it to them. What's happening now is the demand is so great that there isn't the time to give the time, if you had it to give. Um, and that then causes um, something in um, practitioners, it doesn't matter whether they're medics or nurses or paramedics or whatever, that we call moral distress, because we're not able to deliver what we've been trained to give and want to give, and that is a real issue. So thank you for bringing that up. In terms of allied healthcare professionals, there has been a huge increase in AHPs, actually. Um, they're flooding into practices, certainly, um, and probably into secondary care, too. It's just I don't go there these days. Um, but um, so we have um, um, advanced nurse practitioners, we have clinical pharmacists, uh, we have healthcare assistants, we have physios, we have mental health nurses, all sorts of people are coming in um, to give that additional time, but it still isn't enough. It still isn't enough. Can, can I just make a comment? Because this is about resources and for, for today and tomorrow, I've been doing some local research with people I've met with, so family, friends, and other people in terms of, you know, the big question about resources, would you pay more for the health service? And most people say, yes, I would, uh, but we must make sure it's ring-fenced to meet the requirements of waiting lists and it's focused on people. We need to take out issues around waste. There's so much waste, bureaucracy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in the NHS. So, and I think that's a bit about the big conversation I think we need to have with people. But, I, and I would say this, Mark Drakeford said today about there has been such a massive impact in central government in terms of the money we've, that's been taken out of the system over the last 10 years. We were doing all right. Uh, and then certainly for local government, and I know there's colleagues in the room, we were working really hard to get social workers alongside GP practices with social care workers, and we were really spending lots of money and time doing that, and that was working really well. Local government has taken millions out of their budgets over the last 10 years because they had to. There was, no, there was nowhere for them to go. So it's a massive resource issue because there's been so much taken out and we need money put back in, but we also need to address some of those big issues around waste, bureaucracy, what we can do quicker, use of IT, etc. We need to get sharper and a bit slicker. Nigel. Yeah, th some of these cost savings are actually deeply inefficient. Uh, I mean, the point that Camilla made about social workers, I mean, that, that involved much more work because you didn't have a social worker in the team. Think about school nurses, which we've got rid of. A consultant in this room earlier today told me that because essentially the system has got rid of medical secretaries, um, they are, some consultants are now seeing about half as many patients as they used to do because they're doing their own paperwork around all of that. Yet the government, of course, talks about getting rid of pen pushers. Well, you know, we do need those admin systems. And I very much admire what um, the Bevan Commission has done on waste. Uh, and I think this area of waste, this inefficiency, the inefficiency of, of, of salami slicing cuts is a really 
uh, really big one because you need to think about it in the whole system. Kendra, um, come in if you may. Um, I've got a question specifically for you in a bit, um, but just on that because I want to develop that theme in, 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 in a while. What do you think? Um, I was just going to add that the inefficiency trickles down to our education as well. So if you took a survey of medical students and you asked them, do they enjoy placement, do they attend placement, a lot of them would say no, they don't because there's nothing for them to do when they get there and it's a waste of time when they'd rather be at home studying for their exams. So one idea that we've had, and it was mentioned in our um, essay for the Bevan Commission Awards was utilizing medical students um, and all these inefficiencies and the lack of time that clinicians have actually utilizing them. A huge deficit in our education is also talking to patients and getting that holistic understanding of their care. So if there was a way to use students to give patients that time that their doctors might not have, I think that could be a really valuable use of my time and also the patient's time as well. Um, could, could I just expand on the point in saying, okay, we're talking about prioritization, cutting waste, salami slicing. But when I interviewed the health minister in January this year, remember at a time when pressures were at their peak and she'd just paid 200 million quid or something for the heating bill of the NHS um, over the winter, there is not an unlimited resource out there. Now, see, she suggested perhaps health boards should focus on five or six priority areas that they should concentrate on and maybe focus on that at the detriment of other things. Now, that split opinion, it was either, how dare you, because we pay for this, we deserve all that it provides, but others were more pragmatic, saying, actually, isn't that the sensible way to make sure you have it in the future? You know it's a controversial concept, but what do you think about prioritization and what should be prioritized? Well, would you, yeah, yeah. May, may I just come in? I mean. I was involved in the English NHS at the point when we were trying to recover from the last crisis. Now, this crisis is worse, um, but it was a serious crisis at the end of the 90s. Um, and we were very clear there were some priorities we had to do before we could do some others. Right. And actually, we had to win hearts and minds on two things. One we succeeded quite quickly on, which was waiting lists, and one which we didn't succeed on very quickly, which was dirty hospitals. You know? You know, do you remember all those um, hospital-inquired infections and stuff? And once you'd started to move, once the NHS started to move, you could then move on into other priorities. We never did what I really wanted us to do, which was to pivot to health. So we went on from healthcare to really thinking about health and taking you forward into prevention and so on. We never did that. It was one of the failures. But I think that if I were government, I'd be saying, these are the things we've got to do to move us on out of the immediate pr problems here in order that we can then deal with some of these other things. And if we did that, working with our colleagues, and they were buying into that, then actually you'd start to create the momentum that will get you through some of the bad times. Because you can beat your head against the brick wall for some time, but you can't do it forever. And if there's, some, if there's no hope of it improving, then it's really worrying. I know time is slipping away, we could talk all night on this, but one more on this before I ask you the specific question I have for you. <laughs> Okay, this all boils down to listening as well, because we're talking about the fact that there are priorities and everything, because here's the thing, do you, how do you decide? Do you tell a stroke patient that they're not as important as cancer patients? You know, that's a very, I'm sorry, that's a very um, strange way to look at it, in my opinion. In my, my opinion, I believe that, we, number one, let's start with listening, and let's start with using the resources that are already available. So, for example, you know what Camilla said about the social care thing? I'd never even known that something like that existed. But what about the role of the third sector? The third sector organizations who are on the ground walk, working with people who have data to give, who have information to give, because these are the people, these are the ones who are working with people on a local level who can put in data and say, okay, look, these are the hotspots. So for example, in, cardi in, in heart disease, these are the hotspots. In cancer, these are the hotspots. So why not just use what we have? Let's start with what we have and let's start listening more. That's what I think. Thank you very much. Kendra, this is your treat. <laughs> um, it's a comment that was posted eight hours ago, but it's still the most popular comment posted today. How can we encourage younger healthcare workers to attend events such as this? A glance around the hall suggests we're losing their unjaded fresh ideas. And that's a good one, isn't it? 
Um, it is a, a good one. Um, I was talking with my colleague now about the cost. <laughs> the cost of events like these, I think, is the first barrier. Um, so if there was a way of creating incentives for students to come, like free tickets maybe or discounted tickets, um, the competition um, as well, that was a really good incentive to get students involved. But um, reflecting on my experience as a student and opinions of my colleagues, there's a lot of disinterest, I think, about things like this and thinking about healthcare from a policy perspective or um, a structural perspective and trying to solve issues everyone's very much scared towards, I just need to pass my exams and then I can think about these things later. So I think if there was a bigger push within medical schools and healthcare schools to engage students in competitions like yours and just having these conversations as part of our curriculum, I think it will be really, really nice. Briefly. And I also think we assess students half to death. So we need to cut the number <laughs> of exams. Fair. considerably fair enough now a question for you all I want you to answer it if you could in in a couple of sentences um, even though it's a very big question um, but I will go along the line for this finally um, so let's go this way um, should do the founding principles of the NHS as set out in the various quotes that we've seen today from an Aaron Bevan do those fundamental principles still hold strong in the healthcare system today, should they or should they not? Very short answer is yes. <laughs> I think that the. the but but are, they, are they at risk? I think they are at risk because we've lost sight of a whole range of our thinking about how we're responsible for public services. Those goods which can only really be realized if they're goods for everybody. And that's something that's not always easy to, to get across these days, but there are some things that are good for us because they are good for all. You can't simply sectionalize health and say, well, you can be content with high standard here, low standard there, different needs, different standards. The, the universalism of Anarin Bevan's principles remains for me, not just about the health service, but about the whole of our political vision. Nigel, in a couple of sentences, if you could. Well, I, I agree, yes. I think the fundamental principles are right. I, w I think what's changed is the circumstances and actually our knowledge. Um, and our knowledge, for example, that 60 or 70% of our health is due to factors that the health service can't control means you have to think about it very differently. Although that is an argument for ensuring that you're thinking about it in the context of the public sector. So the principles, yes, but they need to adapt and evolve in light of today's circumstances. No. Absolutely, but I would say that, wouldn't I? And, and, and it is, I am passionate about it, and it is very precious to me. And I think it's fixable. We've heard today that we can do it. If we just had the courage and the bravery to sort it out, we could do it in Wales. We've, we've heard that from eminent professors, academics around the world. So we can do it. It's just how we do it. And just when you ask the question, What's the alternative? Because I would really despair if it wasn't available. And if it's fixable, we should fix it. Camilla? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I think that the founding principles, especially the free, um, the NHS is free, I think they'll, it just dismantles so many barriers for a lot of people. Um, so that should definitely stay, I think. Thank you. And Bami? Yes. But the thing is, like 75 years on, there are some things that we might need to look at, we need to look at differently. And I think we need to start being more proactive about prevention, you know, prevention and health initiatives, health awareness, um, equipping members of the public as well to, to help them. Can you show your appreciation to the panel, please?